All right, uh, let's continue our discussion of chapter five. This is part two of two of our lecture where we're looking and trying to get a better insight into closed systems. So let me talk now about ideal gases. And let me start the conversation by an experiment done by Joule. So Joule had a pressurized tank of air. And on this side, we had a, he had an empty cylinder portion. He opened the valve from this pressurized portion to this empty portion. So the air flowed from here into this container. He submerged this setup in water and he observed the temperature change using this thermometer. Well, what he observed is that the temperature did not change. Therefore, what he determined was that the specific heat or the specific heat with constant volume or specific heat with constant pressure did not did not rely on volume change or pressure change. So as the air evacuated from this chamber into here, it did not change the temperature. Therefore, the internal energy or this these properties did not change. So it wasn't dependent on pressure or volume change. So what he concluded was that these terms, these internal energy and this enthalpy terms were dependent on temperature. For And again, this is for an ideal gas. Knowing that, we can express now these terms here. We can say that, knowing that since the internal energy is a function of temperature, we can say that when we integrate this, so let's go back a couple slides, or um, I guess that was in the other presentation. Let's see. But if you guys remember, the definition of specific heat was the partial derivative of internal energy with respect to temperature at a constant volume. That was the definition. But since through Joule's experiment, we determined that temperature that these property that this property is only a function of temperature internal energy we changed it now to a normal derivative and so or an ordinary der derivative so now we're able to integrate this differential equation like so knowing that since on the left hand side we have internal energy as a function of pressure on the right hand side these variables must be a function I'm sorry function of temperature on the right hand side, this must be a function of temperature as well. So knowing that specific heat, and by specific heat I mean these variables here, are a function of temperature, how will we integrate this? So these are a function of temperature and we're integrating with respect to temperature. So we would need some type of relationship that helps us to determine these values here, these internal energies or these enthalpies. Well, fortunate for us, we have tables in the back of our book, which we've already discussed in the last chapter, that we can find out what the value of the internal energy is at a particular condition, knowing the temperature. We can also come up with solutions or Equations approximating this this equal this value here, either through experimental determination or through th theoretical or statistical calculations, that gives us a relationship for the CV and CP properties. Another way that we'll talk about here in the next slide is just to use an average value, but that's difficult because let's look at the way uh, how CP here CP varies with temperature for different gases. So let's just pick air. It's pretty common. As we increase the temperature of air, you can see that it varies nonlinearly with temperature. So how do we solve this problem? If we want to just use a constant value here, or an average value, simplifying things. And the way it simplifies it is that since we assume it's an average value, we can just take this out of the integral and integrate dt. 
from between one and two. So that makes the integration much easier. Well, in order to take an average value, which is the easiest, but the downside is it's the least accurate, we have to take an average. So the average, when I say average, I mean the average between the CP at T1 and the CP at T2, somewhere in the middle here. And when we do that, we're assuming a linear relationship when we know actually between these two points, it's nonlinear. <clears throat> now this is okay to assume, but we have to know that it comes with some error associated with it. But you can see that when we integrate that equation, it makes it a lot easier to solve. Likewise, we can carry out this integration. So this is number two. I'm, I just talked about number three. Let me talk about number two. <clears throat> number two, we can perform an integration knowing, remember, through experimental generation or through statistical thermodynamic relationships, what this CV value is. And we can do that, but it's somewhat cumbersome. And I think we'll do an example of that either in class or in one of these video examples where we use a very accurate value for CV and we solve this integral by hand, but it's tedious. And preferably, it's better to use this type of method if we use a computer. The main advantage of this is that they're very accurate. And probably the most accurate and the easiest, the combination of the two, is simply just to look up these values from our thermodynamics tables, which we have done in Chapter 4. Now, for an ideal gas, we can show that Remember, using the ideal gas law, H is equal to U plus PV, we can replace that with a uh, the ideal gas relationship, PV is equal to MRT, or per unit mass is RT, and we can solve this uh, equation to obtain uh, and manipulate this to obtain CP is equal to CV plus R. So um, this relationship may come in useful for some of the calculations we do later on. Another uh, nomenclature term I'd like to introduce you to is the specific heat ratio. So here we have the specific heat ratio as a K may also be expressed as a gamma in some uh, texts is a ratio between CP and CV and this value varies from about uh, 1.3 to 1.67 and it, it depends really what type of gas you're talking about. Air is going to be have a value of 1.4 and some gases, combustion products, maybe 1.3. It really depends on what it is that we're talking about. Maybe you're interested in using something like this for some type of steam. Well, we had to look up these tab these values somewhere in our text if it's something a little bit more exotic than air or some of these other values that we're talking about. So let me just wrap up this talk uh, talking about we talked about gases, specific heats of gases, but what about sp internal energies and specific heats of solids and liquids? Well the great thing about these is that we assume that they're constant. We can show that they're constant mathematically. But CP and CV for a piece of iron is basically constant. And we're going to assume that that's the case for our, um, <clears throat> for our class, that we can interchange CP and CV for solids and uh, also for liquids. So, you know, if we're looking at, if we're trying to determine the internal energy of a solid, we could just, or a liquid, we could just use our C value and note this is just C it's not CP or CV since we're assuming those are both the same. Here we have uh, some examples of what if we're dealing with either a solid or a liquid so H here's by definition H is equal to U plus PV. We can break this down as if we write it in differential terms DH is equal to DU plus VDP plus PDV. Now dv is going to be basically zero right for a uh, solid 
and dp may be also zero for a solid. So here we could rewrite this as d for a solid, change in h is equal to the change in internal energy, which is by through our approximation, c times delta t. For a liquid, uh, let's say going through a heater where we have a constant pressure process, we would eliminate this term here, and we would have the internal energy <coughs> is equal to, or the enthalpy is equal to, delta U is equal to C times delta T. So um, we can show some other values here, like if we have a pump, our, our enthalpy gain is primarily going to be from the pressure increase across the inlet and exit of the pump. And uh, there's some other values here, but what the main get grab for this is that our internal energies for solids, are, we're going to assume is going to remain constant. So we'll work out some example problems here on the next couple lectures, and then we'll move on to chapter six.